Welcome to this evening I Icon Textile Group uh, talk. Textiles are the stories they tell. My name is Maria Pardos and I am an events coordinator for the Icon Textile Group. Before we begin today, we are going, I'm going to run through the usual housekeeping. We are using our home Wi-Fi, so please be patient uh, if we have any connectivity problems. If that's the case, we will try to solve the problems as soon as possible. Uh, there is a chat function at the bottom of the screen. Uh, please use, use uh, this there one if you want to say who and where you are, or if you, want, you wish to share any information with the rest of the attendees. Uh, there is also uh, at the bottom of the screen a Q&A function. So if you have any direct, direct questions to Howard or speaker tonight, please use, use this function and we will have some allocated time at uh, at the end of the evening to go, to go through them. If you're having any issues uh, watching this webinar, you can try to solve them by uh, the view options at the top of the screen and fit, uh, hit the fit to window uh, uh, selection. And that normally helps. This uh, talk is being recorded and it will be shortly uh, being uploaded to the Icon um, YouTube channel. Um, there is lots to watch there, uh, so if you want to catch up or rewatch any previous events, you can do so here. Uh, there, um, some of the videos are uh, set as private, so if uh, the best way to access them is through the link uh, sent directly to the attendees, the email, or directly through the Icon website. So uh, now, with no further ado, I'm going to introduce you to our textile group chair, Cassinia Marco, who is going to be our host tonight. Cassinia, all to you now. Oh, hello, everyone. Um, I hope you can hear me. Um, and welcome uh, to this first um, talk of our 2022 season. Um, the title, as you can see, is Textiles and the Stories They Tell. In your own house right now, you may be wearing clothes you don't know how to make or know who made them. You may only know from a label what it's made from and where it may have been made, but not by whom. You may be sitting on a chair made from wood from a forest you've never heard of in a country you've never visited. You live in a house full of stories. Though cloth is a language through which a, a people can tell stories about themselves, their community and their place in the universe. And this is particularly true of what we choose to wear. So this presentation will focus on a number of recent costume projects that have come through Howard Sutcliffe's studio that have notable and sometimes rather unsettling histories and how the process of conservation along with scientific analysis has helped to clarify and consolidate that knowledge. Howard will present a number of selected case histories including a shoe belonging to Leah Schwartz, um, a performer with the Ringling and Barnum and Bailey Circus, uh, this, that, that particular object inspired me to, to invite him to do this talk. Um, and also another object, a, a bullet hole ridden coat from the Battle of Shiloh and other examples. So uh, let me introduce you to Howard. Howard is the principal conservator and owner of River Region Costume and Textile Conservation, a private practice with studios in Arleigh, in Winston County, Alabama, and Nashville, Tennessee. And he is speaking to us tonight from his home and main studio in Arleigh. Howard has previously worked as the head textile conservator at the Detroit Institute of Arts and in the textile conservation studios at the Philadelphia Museum of Art and American Textile History Museum in the US. In his native UK, he has worked at the National Trust Textile Conservation Studio in Norfolk and National Museums Liverpool. Howard is a professional associate member of the American Institute for Conservation of Historic and Artistic Works and is a current board member 
and past chair of the North American Textile Conservation Conference. And we are extremely honored, Howard, that you have agreed to speak to us and I now pass over to you. Oh, well, thank you, Ksenia and Maria and the rest of the ICON board for inviting me um, to talk to you all today. Um, I have to say when Ksenia uh, approached me about this a couple of months ago, um, I thought it was a great idea and I put together my little abstract and um, uh, about a month ago or about, a, yeah, about a month ago, um, I was working in California and one of my colleagues uh, mentioned like, oh, I saw you're giving a, you know, a talk for ICON and I was like, oh, great, they have it online, I should go and check it out. And um, we read the abstracts and uh, I was like, oh, wow, kind of a, a Holocaust object, something from the Civil War and then um, artifacts from a mass shooting. That's not the most uplifting um, uh, selection of objects to talk about. Um, so I am going to kind of talk about two of those, but I've changed the final one um, to something that is pink and um, not fluffy. Uh, it's definitely pink and crispy, but hopefully um, it will uh, lighten the mood somewhat. So uh, let's let's get started with the first slide. Here we go. So the first uh, object that I'm going to talk about uh, today is uh, this little shoe, and um, it is from the part of the collection of the Zeckelman Holocaust Center in Farmington Hills, Michigan. And that's um, a traditionally uh, a traditional uh, Jewish uh, community um, north of Detroit, um, up in Michigan. And um, the uh, it's more of a uh, an archive um, institution. They don't have many objects, and so most of their displays are very documentary, um, film related. Um, but they do have uh, this little shoe um, in their collection, and um, it's interesting that those of you that will have visited places like Yad Vashem and the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum um, in Washington, D.C. will have seen kind of uh, large displays of um, anonymous shoes. And they have become um, very synonymous with the Holocaust. They're a very visceral, visual reminder of the mass murders that, were, that took place during that time. Um, this shoe is uh, a little bit different uh, because we actually know quite a little, quite a bit about its history um, and it can be linked to a uh, particular person. And that person was um, Lia Graf or Lia Schwartz. Um, she was born uh, Margaret Firthman into a Jewish family um, in 1913. And Lyra was uh, a little person. She was 22 inches tall. Um, and she was a performer um, kind of in her native Germany before moving to the United States to become part of the Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey circuses uh, that were incredibly popular during the 1920s and 30s. And uh, she became... Um, very well known after this photograph on the right was uh, taken of her. And um, she really got her, her 15 minutes of fame uh, in 1933 um, when the circus was in Washington, DC. Um, at, at the time, the Senate Banking and Currency Committees were holding hearings for the Pecora Commission, which was basically a commission that was set up to investigate the failings that led to um, the stock market crash in 1929, and uh, which obviously led to the Great Depression. Um, and on the day that JP Morgan was due to testify, that is the chap that you see there on the right, um, uh, Liar's uh, quick thinking, uh, uh, press agent Charles Leaf kind of took her to the Senate uh, caucus room and uh, during the melee that was happening kind of picked her up and plunked her in the lap of J.P. Morgan 
and um, much to the to the the press's delight and it was basically uh, billed as a meeting of the world's smallest woman with the world's richest man um, at that point jp had pretty much been blamed uh, for the great depression and he was uh, not only the richest man in america he was also one of the most reviled um, but this meeting kind of uh, actually was a great benefit to him. He um, reacted nicely, had a little chat with Liar, and um, kind of people uh, started to see this more human side of him, which uh, he, he definitely built on in the, in the months following uh, this uh, photograph being taken. Um, and... The circus continued to uh, perform, but uh, I think I think Lyra didn't um, particularly like the attention that she got from all of this, and um, ultimately ended up in Coney Island, New York. Um, I hate to use the phrase uh, "working in a in a freak show," but that's uh, how it was billed at the time. And she basically uh, took money and kind of told people about her uh, adventures uh, in Washington, D.C. Um, ultimately, the, the attention just got too much for her, and she moved back to Germany um, in, I think, 1935. And unfortunately, at that time, Germany was very different to the country that she left in the 1920s. And... Um, in 1937, I think, she was um, arrested as a, a useless person, was the term um, coined, and uh, ultimately um, she was sent to Auschwitz and died in the camps there. Um, so I was told this story when I went to visit uh, the Holocaust Center. Obviously, I was uh, Kind of hoping for a different outcome so it's a very very sad story and so there's a lot of uh, emotion attached to this to this tiny little object um, and if we can move on to the next slide you can see that uh, the shoe itself is really barely uh, five inches long so it really is tiny um, and it was uh, collected by um, somebody who knew Liar in the camps and uh, they were ultimately rescued and uh, or freed and uh, ended up living in Canada and just across the bridge from Detroit. And so um, their family um, donated it to, to the center. To my knowledge, it's never been on view. Um, the archivist contacted me because she was noticing that it was uh, deteriorating uh, quite rapidly um, in storage and so she wanted me to, uh, to have a look at it. So next slide please. Um, it was very interesting, sometimes it just takes kind of a, 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 new, a fresh pair of eyes looking at, at an object and so or maybe, I, you know, I think conservators look at uh, objects slightly differently to, uh, to other people that work in museums. And um, so as soon as I looked at this, I was like, oh, it's kind of interesting, kind of like this painted surface uh, that it has. And um, there's, I think originally the shoe was probably a dark brown leather. And then there was at least one layer of gold paint followed by um, this uh, silver paint uh, on top of that. And um, it really makes sense because Lyra did not have a lot of money and um, she probably just kind of uh, painted the, uh, the shoe to kind of, you know, match her outfits. And so, like I said, there's at least three layers of paint um, on there. Um, and so the next slide, please. Structurally, it was a, a little unstable. Um, the, the lining was quite um, fragmentary, as you can see there, kind of uh, there's leather linings inside there that were curling up and breaking away from the actual shoe. And then obviously the, the strap um, uh, is coming apart. There's been, uh, effort made to repair it. You can see there on the right, there are some kind of large stitches there. Um, 
I am presuming that these shoes were well used um, prior to her being sent to um, Auschwitz. And so um, it was kind of very important to retain a lot of these old repairs that were made. I mean, these, these were not children's shoes. They were probably made specifically for her um, at some expense. And so that also explains her kind of wanting to keep painting them and repairing them uh, to keep them going. So next slide. So really, uh, treatment uh, was, was actually fairly straightforward, um, but it consisted, uh, it started to begin with uh, surface cleaning to begin with. And so I'm just uh, very, very gently swabbing the surface of the shoe using uh, deionized water. Um, it took several passes um, just to kind of like remove a lot of the surface grime and dirt. And so you can see um, on the right there how the, uh, the paint layer actually uh, shined up quite well. Um, I thought that the paint would actually be more friable um, than it was. It looks like it should be friable, and, but um, I think kind of whatever uh, was flaking had already flaked off. So the paint layer was, uh, was reasonably stable. So it took cleaning quite well. Uh, next slide. Um, I did, however, do uh, some consolidation of the paint layer um, here, just applying Clucel G in ethanol. I think it was around 12% uh, that I used uh, the Clucel G at, um, just to make sure that there were no further losses. And obviously that was applied just using a, a small brush. You can also see on the interior, um, a lot of those curled sections of uh, the leather lining, um, I just set back in place using um, Lascaux 360. Um, I think I was very lucky in being one of the last people to order a couple of tubs of, uh, of 360. So I still have those uh, kind of going. But um, that was applied neat, just left to dry a little bit and then kind of like uh, just tamped down and it, it worked pretty well. So next slide. And then with the, uh, with the strap repair, um, obviously I wanted to uh, keep, uh, make sure that those, uh, the old repair stitches were as visible as possible. And so I used um, little, basically little bridges of Japanese tissue just to strengthen the strap and uh, hold it in place. Um, I applied more of the tissue to the underside of the strap so that the, stitches would be uh, visible um, on, the, uh, on the outside there. But you can see just kind of like a little, a little patch of the tissue paper being adhered in place on the front. Um, and I think that was kind of like a heavyweight uh, Astoyo Gampi paper. Um, and again, uh, secured using Clucel G um, in ethanol. And so the next slide. Um, the shoe uh, was presented to me kind of wrapped in tissue paper just in a, in a box. And so I was like, well, we need kind of like a little mount um, of some sort here just to kind of hold it secure, uh, both for storage and display. And so I just made a simple kind of little blue board um, cutout mount that it could sit in. Um, the, uh, the sole of the shoe was actually quite rounded. Um, so having uh, that little cutout helped to kind of hold uh, everything in place. So I have a couple of layers of the blue board uh, with the cutout and then kind of like another layer of polyester uh, needle punch felt on top of that. And then the next slide. And then everything was covered in, um, I think it's kind of, I think it was a linen. I think it's a, a gray linen from um, the Ulster Linen Company. Um, and so it just kind of uh, holds the shoe. We did talk about making an internal form for it, but honestly, the, the shoe is very, very rigid and there is really very little movement. And if it ever does go on display, they really want to be able to show the, uh, the lining as well. So um, we felt that um, an internal support wasn't really all that necessary. So next slide. What was necessary, however, was improving the little box that it was uh, presented to me in. So I made an, a little internal structure, um, kind of a cradle that would enable it to be handled uh, easily. And these little pads that just kind of like hold it in place. So um, 
I think that's the final slide for uh, that particular project. Um, it was just, it was, it was a really interesting um, thing to, little object to, to work on. Um, just having me look at it, um, I was able to give the museum more information that they had previously. Um, they were also amazed to learn that I had found pictures online of her wearing the shoes. Um, the, uh, if you cast your minds back to the picture with JP Morgan, the one next to it showed her, um, there we go, we can go back. Da -da. Standing on a table wearing these shoes. And they were like, what? This is, well, we had no idea these were existed. These existed. And it's like, oh, well, you know, there's, there's this thing called Google and you can just kind of look at anything these days. So, um, they, they now have kind of uh, a little bit more information than they did. Um, the shoes that she's wearing, I think, are different in the, uh, the JP Morgan photo because uh, they have a, a little uh, strap and buckle and they're more square at, the, uh, square at the toe. But the one where she's standing on top of that table, that's definitely those shoes. So we can move, uh, move on. Let's scooch through those. And there we go. So we'll move on to the next uh, project here. And um, this comes from uh, Shiloh National Battlefield, which is uh, a national park. It's administered by the, the National Park Service. Um, it's about two hours drive from my studio uh, here in Ali and um, Shiloh uh, was one of the earliest and certainly one of the bloodiest battles of the American Civil War. Um, it took place in um, 1862 and uh, which is slightly ironic seen as Shiloh as a name means place of peace. It certainly wasn't that for, uh, for a while. Um, it is situated where Alabama Tennessee and Mississippi all meet together. Um, and so now it's actually um, a, a very beautiful place. It's a beautiful park. Um, they have maintained the battlefields. There's been a lot of, um, you know, archaeological study done there. Um, from, from my perspective, it's more interesting because it's a great place to go bird watching. And they also uh, have these uh, amazing archaeological sites. Um, it was a uh, 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 basically a South Appalachian Mississippian um, Indian culture existed there. And so they have these uh, burial mounds, um, which you can see in that photo in the, in the bottom right there. Um, so there's a whole, there's a whole um, basically village of, uh, of these burial mounds um, situated throughout the battlefield. So next slide, please. So the objects I'm going to talk about from here is uh, a great coat, a Civil War um, great coat um, worn by this chap. And his name was Francis Eugene Whitfield. Um, he was he was a lawyer by trade and then uh, joined up um, and uh, fought for the Confederacy. Um, there are, there's a lot of um, Civil War artifacts and uniform pieces out there. Very few of them um, have uh, great provenance. Um, very few of them can be attached to people um, that they know fought in battles. And so let's, let's take a look at the coat in the next slide. So here it is, or what's left of it. Um, and so this is, this is rare in that um, you, they know who wore this coat and they know that he was at the Battle of Shiloh. Um, and the park acquired this uh, actually from, from a family member, I think only in 2017, 2018. So it's not been part of their collection for a long time um, at all. And, um, uh, it, it certainly looks like it, but it was stored in a trunk for, for many, many years and uh, was in quite rough shape uh, when I first took a look at it. Um, I've worked on a lot of uh, 
great coats and frock coats over the years. Uh, most of them have been all wool. This is kind of interesting because the, the warp is cotton and the weft is wool. And so you have extreme kind of loss of the weft due to insect activity. Uh, and then you have these very large areas of just bare cotton warps sitting there. Um, and so let's move on to the next slide. Here is uh, the interior linings. You can see there's as little of those left as there is of the front, um, just kind of like very large losses throughout. And the next slide, please. So when you're, when you're dealing with uh, objects from, uh, from the Civil War, there's always stories attached to them, uh, particularly those that have been held onto by uh, family members. Um, so uh, uh, Colonel Whitfield um, was uh, shot at Shiloh. Um, he, I think, served with some distinction um, in the army and was a, was a pretty good sold, uh, soldier. Um, but he was shot um, and family members actually uh, attached um, little labels to the front of the coat um, that told you kind of like this belonged to, uh, to Colonel Whitfield and then uh, also where the bullet hole was. Um, some of you may remember I talked uh, a while, well, I think back in 2014 at AIC in, um, uh, in San Francisco about another Civil War coat that um, I worked on for the, for the Tennessee State Museum. And um, there's always kind of uh, family stories around these things. For, for that particular coat, it was um, that the uh, the wearer's mother had collected uh, a union coat and had dyed it uh, to make it look more like a confederate coat uh, for her son to wear and um, the museum had never really done any analysis of this and so we were able to uh, do some dye analysis um, uh, that really kind of like proved the family story was true um, with this one, the, the story is, is a little bit more interesting in terms of there's a disagreement uh, as to where he was actually shot. Um, the, uh, the, the family law kind of really uh, states that um, he was shot in the hip. Um, the, uh, there are some medical records um, of uh, Whitfield's treatment um, in the field hospital at Shiloh. Um, that said that he was uh, shot in a slightly more delicate area um, and that he was kind of uh, shot in the scrotum, um, which doesn't sound like it's fun. Um, and so part of this project was kind of, can you figure out where the bullet hole is and uh, will that uh, kind of confirm either or story? And uh, so it's like, okay, that's, that sounds uh, like a challenge, definitely. So let's have the next slide. Um, the coat was just, I mean, uh, e extraordinary levels of, of structural damage and loss. Um, so here you have kind of uh, shoulders um, and just kind of like the holes uh, through to the lining. And let's have the next slide. So treatment uh, started out uh, again with just kind of uh, surface cleaning um, with low power vacuum suction. Um, I added filters into the vacuum cleaner to be able to collect all of that dirt and dust. Um, it's really interesting with Civil War pieces, kind of like archeological pieces um, that, you know, if you're looking at uh, the type of soil and pollen and grass seeds, you can really pinpoint um, the battlefields on which these uh, uh, artifacts were they worn or certainly in the case of flags where they were flown. Um, and so after surface cleaning, um, uh, just a lot of humidification. Um, fortunately, um, 
the levels of degradation um, allowed a lot of access to this object. And so it was kind of um, easy to separate layers and uh, treat them individually. So um, lots of uh, humidification. Um, let's have the next slide. And uh, again, because of the levels of damage, I was able to um, support uh, a lot of the elements um, separately without too much trouble. And so here you have obviously um, the, uh, the, the skirts at the front have been humidified and I'm aligning all of those uh, warps. Um, those were uh, then supported using uh, pieces of uh, cotton broadcloth that were uh, dyed to match and then over the surface, um, I used a nylon bobbinet uh, dye to match, which it just kind of like toned down the, the stark contrast between uh, the wool and the cotton um, a little bit. But there was uh, just a lot of couching. Um, so let's have the next slide. For the bodice, um, a little bit more complicated. And so, uh, but again, kind of access was great because most of the linings were missing. Um, so the patches were basically basted to the in interior of the coats. And then um, I was able to kind of flip everything over and do uh, the more detailed support work um, from, the, from the exterior. So next slide. Uh, really uh, one of the very kind of complicated, more complicated um, elements of, of this treatment was reconstructing those uh, arm sides basically because most of uh, the, the link between the sleeves and the, the jacket was very, very tenuous. So uh, these photos just show me kind of building up those areas using patches and recreating uh, the seams of the sleeve. Uh, next slide. And then there was areas uh, of the coats, particularly on the bodice, uh, that were um, <clears throat> padded. And so obviously I had to kind of uh, replace some of that body. So that was done just by building up layers of uh, polyester needle punch felts that were inserted in. Then you have the patch and then the netting, uh, the net goes on the, the surface and everything gets stitched together. Um, so that's just basically a, a, a recreation of a the uh, lapel there. So next slide. So here we have the famous bullet hole. Um, and so once I had uh, that front skirt um, fully supported, there was an area that uh, had, and you can see it in the, the center there of uh, the photo on the left, there was an area of the warps that were definitely singed and looked like they'd been burnt. So that obviously was the uh, was the bullet hole. Um, and so uh, that was then recreated uh, by just kind of like cutting back the support materials and uh, folding them back and securing them. Um, Ashley, the curator at the park, didn't particularly like just the open look. And so we decided then just to put a patch of uh, black cotton behind um, behind the hole just to uh, denote where it was. So next slide, please. So again, similar thing with uh, the lining materials. Um, fortunately, the, you know, the connections between all of these layers were very, very tenuous. So it was easy to get materials, uh, support materials in there and underneath. Um, and so here we have kind of lining the, uh, the skirts. Um, and the next slide. So there we just have a detail of uh, the patches that are finished there on the right. Um, and then starting to, uh, to figure out what's going on on the, uh, the bodice linings on the left. And so next slide. And um, here again, this was another case where uh, there needed to be more body with the, uh, the bodice lining. And so I'm inserting kind of uh, another layer, at least one layer, I think, of um, needle punch uh, felt in there. And then um, another uh, kind of cotton broadcloth 
on the right there. So next slide. And here again, just some more details of uh, building up the lining uh, patches, kind of recreating the arms eyes in the center there, kind of uh, fitting in all the uh, support material to kind of recreate the, uh, the pockets. Um, and then uh, on the right, uh, just making sure that all the, the seams uh, of the new lining material follow the old. Um, and so next slide. So here we have the, uh, the, the bodice lining um, after treatment. Obviously, once the, uh, the cotton was in there, that was all then covered with uh, nylon net uh, dyed to match as well. And the next slide, please. There we have the full line, the full uh, lining after treatment. And uh, the next slide, please. So here's the coat front and back after treatment. Um, with the park service, it's uh, it's really um, interesting. And so a lot of parks have do have uh, curators. Um, most of the people they would most of the people um, you know in charge are definitely not museum people. Um, that's certainly the case at Shiloh at this time. Um, and so uh, even though Ashley, uh, who was the curator, um, was very, very happy with the end result, um, the superintendent I, of the park, I think was expecting it to look um, like new. And uh, he really didn't like the look of uh, all of the bare warps. And um, so he actually asked me to uh, kind of redo it and cut all the warps off. And I was like, well, that's not really how things work. Um, and so it's kind of, it's, it's really interesting uh, working with people like that, that he obviously had a, a very different outcome in mind um, to the one that he ended up with. And it was, it, was, uh, it you know, after I explained, uh, uh, what I did and what cutting all the warps out would do, um, he kind of got it and he was like, okay. So um, it's, uh, it's, always, it's always interesting dealing with um, non-museum people um, in these, you know, that are, that are, you know, ultimately in charge of these projects. So it's, it's uh, um, there's an interesting education aspect um, as well. Fortunately, he is now retired um, and uh, I've done several more projects with Shiloh. Um, I was there for um, a number of weeks last year doing a uh, condition collection survey for the park. And uh, next slide, please. And uh, during that time, they got these pants in, uh, or what used to be trousers. And so these are actually uh, the trousers that go with the coat. These are uh, Eugene Whitfield's trousers. Um, and they came from a different family member. Um, it's uh, really interesting. Again, they have um, the, uh, the, the labels with the same handwriting. Um, in there, and so I actually uh, pick these up um, next week to uh, to work on over the summer. So they'll be um, quite a challenge. Um, and actually, Maria, if we can go back to the to the previous slide, uh, I totally forgot about the the bullet hole placement. So. Um, uh, as you can see there, the little black bullet hole just above um, the label on the, the left-hand slide, um, it was, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing kind of the medical records that he was shot in the groin are, are a little bit more true and that the family, um, uh, you know, was, was just telling people that, the, uh, that he was shot in the, in the hip um, to save face a little bit. But it, it, does, it does appear that, yes, he was definitely shot in a, that more slightly uh, delicate area. Um, it did not stop him from having two more kids after the Civil War ended, however. So it, it, it certainly didn't seem to slow him down. Um, so let's uh, move on to uh, the next slide after the trousers. We can go to the next one. And so this will be uh, the final project that I'll talk about today, the pink and crispy um, 
what came to be known as the Cape from Hell. Um, and so this object uh, is, a, is a cape, we'll see it in the next slide, but we'll just stay here for a second. Um, and it belonged to Marjorie Merriweather Post. And um, the Post family were um, contemporaries of Kellogg and they had um, a, a serial empire. They were competitors of Kellogg's. Um, but by the time Marjorie kind of like came along um, at the end of the, uh, of the 19th century, they were extraordinarily wealthy. Um, she was certainly one of the, the wealthiest women in the United States um, in, the, uh, in the 1920s and 30s. And um, her house in the top left there, Hillwood, is uh, in Washington, D.C. and um, is run as a museum and... Uh, it's a beautiful museum, beautiful gardens. It's kind of basically her, uh, her collections. Um, her winter home down there in the bottom left um, is, uh, that is Mar-a-Lago and it is now slightly more famous for uh, its current resident whose name we won't mention, um, but he's orange and was the 45th president of the United States. Um, and so let's have the next slide. So here is the cape. Um, so I generally uh, have not worked for Hillwood. Um, I'm very good friends with their director. So we, we go on vacation together and things like that. So it was always better not to kind of like confuse uh, work and pleasure, but um, this cape and its matching dress were sent to uh, another conservator. Um, and I, you know, I, I, I suspect she is much more sensible than I am. She worked on, she worked on the dress and she was like, there is no way I want to work on the cape and sent it back. And so I was talking to Kate one day about another project that I'd worked on that was, um, a fairly large adhesive project. And Kate was like, oh, well, we have this cape and we also have this exhibition that we would like to use this cape in. Maybe you can take a look. And so um, they sent me some photos. Uh, one of those photos is on the left there. Um, both Kate and the curator, Megan, were um, fairly scared to kind of open it out fully. Um, it, it, it is in, it is in uh, very poor condition, so I can understand why. Um, and so, you know, I, I wrote up my proposal um, based on this limited knowledge, and then uh, they shipped the, the piece down to me um, here. And um, uh, it did not disappoint. It was uh, in terrible, terrible condition. Um, so I, I did manage to get it kind of like laid out on my tables here in the studio. Um, just extreme um, levels of shattering throughout. And again, it had been um, like the, uh, the Confederate coat, it had been stored in the trunk and there had been uh, water seepage in there. And so there was, there was a lot of uh, condition issues. Um, but they really wanted to uh, use the cape um, in uh, a show that I think only just closed um, in February um, called The Roaring Twenties at Hillwood. And um, it was really an exploration of uh, Marjorie's wardrobe through the 1920s. Um, and uh, they were hoping that this was um, a cape that was uh, designed by Natalia Goncharova. Um, it was made by uh, a company called Thurn in New York, um, but uh, Goncharova uh, did do the design. And so the conservation really helped uh, Megan, um, the curator, to kind of uh, confirm all of that um, uh, provenance. Um, interestingly, they have a, a similar a piece that is in a, a red silk. Um, uh, that is in absolutely perfect condition. So there was there was something about this uh, the the pinky peach color that um, was was just uh, not great. So let's let's move on to the next slide. So um, the uh, the cape itself is is kind of like a, a crepe machine, and then the lining is just kind of like a straightforward crepe. Um, 
And then it has these winglets um, that were kind of like the sleeves, really, although they're not really sleeves. They just kind of like covered um, the shoulders and arms um, that were made up from uh, lots of applique pieces of um, silk taffeta uh, surrounded by uh, silver bugle beads. Um, on each side, um, heavily gathered along the top, but there's six feet of fabric there. So there's six feet of that applique um, fabric that forms the wings. Um, but here you can just see kind of uh, some of the extreme uh, shattering um, that is going on throughout. And the next slide, please. Um, these two images show uh, some of the water damage. Um, there's kind of a little, you know, dye transfer there on the right, and then on the on the left hand side, you see kind of uh, the tide lines that um, here they're they're along the uh, the hemline or what's left of the hemline, um, but those were really kind of uh, all over the Cape. And next slide. And uh, these are the little, the little winglets. Um, as you can see, the silk there was just as in bad a shape as everywhere else. And so um, this is uh, pretty representative of just kind of shattering of all of those little applique um, pieces. So next slide. So really, to begin with, it was um, I was uh, very trepidatious about uh, doing any sort of surface cleaning, just because it was in uh, it was so crispy and um, it wasn't uh, it didn't have kind of like high levels of uh, particulate surface soiling. Most of everything, you know, if there was there, it was mostly just kind of like fractured silt fibers. So I decided to actually go ahead and do humidification, very gentle humidification um, to begin with. And um, I was actually going on um, a work trip to Beaufort, South Carolina for a couple of weeks. And so I set up this makeshift uh, humidification tent um, on the tables in the studio, um, basically just piled up ethafoam um, around the Cape, um, some little dishes of water. Um, and then wrapped everything in plastic and uh, left it for those two weeks. Um, I told my partner, uh, Rusty, to kind of like check on it um, every day just to make sure that, you know, nothing untoward was, uh, was growing on it and everything was fine. Um, by the end of the, uh, the two week period, uh, the RH had actually uh, raised up to uh, about 75. Um, so it certainly wasn't overwhelming, but it, it really did kind of like do enough just to kind of um, make the fibers a little bit more subtle that I could start to move it around. So next slide. And then move around and also do kind of like a little bit more targeted uh, humidification using uh, small pieces of Gore-Tex. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so once I was happy enough with that, I was able just to go ahead and uh, do the surface cleaning uh, with the vacuum and then uh, a little bit of further cleaning uh, of those tide lines, um, really just by brushing them uh, with deionized water. Um, and they, they kind of really moved uh, quite significantly and easily. Um, particularly along the hemline. Some of the larger areas in the main body of the Cape, um, I found that I was really just moving um, uh, the stain around. And so I, I left those um, pretty much well alone just because the silk was so deteriorated in those areas, it was better to end up with, um, it was better to retain kind of the stained silk rather than uh, ending up with uh, with large with more large holes. There's plenty of large holes already, but I didn't want to cause any more. So next slide, please. Um, so obviously here, kind of uh, dyeing up uh, support materials. Um, I really used um, organza from uh, Whaley's, and uh, obviously the the nylon bobbinet from Dukeries. So you can you can take the boy out of the northwest, but uh, I I pretty much still buy everything from the UK. So next slide, please. So really, once uh, surface cleaning and humidification was complete, I was then able to start kind of working my way through um, the Cape, 
really methodically just kind of uh, supporting it. And um, next slide, please. So obviously, um, I had kind of like a lengthy uh, conversation with both Megan, the curator, and Kate um, Market at the house. And I, you know, I was like, look, you know, really the only option for me here is to do kind of like a fairly extensive adhesive treatment. And, um, you know, it is, it's going to be a lot. There's going to be, you know, it's, it's, this is what it is, um, you know, otherwise, you know, the cape is basically just going to stay in a box. You're, you know, this was really the only option uh, open to us in terms of trying to get this thing on display, which they understood and were, were completely fine with. Um, so really, uh, the initial uh, part of it was kind of going through and stabilizing the large uh, areas of loss. And so either side of these large splits, I was kind of using little bridges of um, the nylon net coated with um, Lascaux 498360, um, uh, I think at 10%, um, just to kind of like start to build everything back together and kind of like hold it in one piece. And so that's what you're seeing here um, is uh, just kind of building up those edges. So next slide, please. Um, again, more of the same. So you can see kind of uh, there was there was also, you know, a lot of little shards. Um, with this, so uh, there was an element of kind of jigsaw puzzle about it, of kind of uh, finding out where all these little little pieces went. Um, in the central side slide there, you can see the reverse side. So you can start to see those little patches of net being built up just to kind of hold the splits in place. Um, I was, it was good kind of like, again, the level of degradation provided a lot of access, but where there wasn't access to the reverse, obviously I'm then sliding uh, little patches um, in between uh, the outer and the lining layers, which is what you can see happening there on the right hand image. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so the color is slightly off on this slide. Um, the, the match was actually a lot better with the organza, but it's kind of nice that you can, it shows up a little darker in these photos. So here you can start to see kind of like the consolidated uh, areas of loss. Um, and then just kind of like these, these large uh, sections that are missing. Um, so those were then supported using uh, patches of the organza uh, that were slipped underneath. And then the edge of the, um, uh, net was used to uh, stitch those down to the organza. Uh, so next slide. And then really on the surface of all of that um, was another layer of adhesive coated net um, just to kind of hold everything together. Um, here you can see on the, uh, the right hand side um, Kind of like some of the stitching around uh, the organza, the edge of the organza patches. I think this is on one of the hemline pieces that would have been folded then over into the other side. So next slide. One of the one of the big problems that uh, we didn't really anticipate until I got into the conservation of this was that the crepe of uh, the lining had actually shrunk quite a lot, and so. Uh, obviously because uh, of the, uh, the, the water ingress in the trunk that it was stored in. And so that had really kind of uh, contracted and pulled at the hemline and really caused a lot of that splitting. Um, if I had tried to put everything back together, there would have been kind of uh, extensive bagging of the, uh, the outside um, silk. Um, and so we just, and it, you know, the cape would not have hung properly. Um, and so, uh, again, in consult consultation with, with Megan and Kate, we decided to actually keep the lining and the outer layer separate, um, just so that the cape would hang a little bit better. And so basically, in the, in the right hand bottom image there, you see that I created two, two separate hem lines. Based. So next slide, please. And then, uh, Really, um, the, the, the winglets were, were treated in the same way. Um, 
And so I, you know, worked my way through 12 feet of these things, just kind of inserting uh, little patches of, uh, of silk. I think for these, I used kind of uh, both the organza and a taffeta as well. Um, I think a taffeta for the pinks because they were slightly, uh, it was a slightly heavier fabric. Um, so again, the patch goes on the inside, uh, net on the surface, uh, not adhesive coated net, uh, just kind of, um, and then everything kind of like got stitched together in this case. So next slide, please. Uh, and again, um, the hemlines had to be recreated on the winglets. So 12 feet of hemline. Um, Kind of going uh, going back in. I listen to uh, a lot of food and murder podcasts to kind of get me through um, all of this. And then next slide, please. So here we have kind of uh, one of the finished uh, winglets um, on the uh, on the left hand side there, and then on the right you can see one of the the major damaged areas. Uh, those large splits uh, that are supported. Uh, so the next slide. So here we have the uh, the cape um, after treatment uh, laid out. Um, and so you can really start to get kind of like the full effect of uh, how the uh, the applique panels were meant to look like a, a stained glass uh, window. Um, the next slide, please. And here we have the cape from the front uh, with the, its little hood. Um, and then the next slide, which I think is the final slide. So on, on the left hand side, um, uh, as the cape finished, I just did kind of, I, you know, have a basic body form here in the studio. So I did like a little try on just to kind of like see how everything, um, hung together, um, and how stable it was. And then on the right, uh, you can see the cape uh, with its matching dress um, in the uh, in the exhibition. Um, um, next to it, you can see the uh, the red piece, uh, which is in you know fabulous condition, um, and the pink one next to it. Um, one of the uh, one of the more interesting aspects, I guess, of, uh, of private practice is that you know sometimes you don't get to see the project through to uh, fruition, and so you know the cape got packed up here and and uh, sent back up to DC, and uh, you know unfortunately I didn't get to install it, um, so I'm not a hundred percent happy with how it looks in this photo. I think it could have uh, looked a, a little bit more elegant. She certainly looks like she's carrying a couple of pumpkins um, under each arm there. So I think it could have looked better, but um, I'm just happy that uh, it made the trip to DC and, you know, it is still hanging together. So, and I think we have come to the, uh, the end of the slides. Thank you, Howard. Thank you very much for that. Um, we have a number of questions for you. Um, no. That's okay. Um, we have a question um, asking about the cleaning of the shoes, your first project. Uh, was the deionized water used at room temperature or did you use warmer water or, you know, uh, to enable the cleaning? Uh... I would say, so I, I did that at the lab, um, at my studio in Detroit, and it, it uh, tends to run a little bit, the system there tends to run a little bit warmer than room temperature, um, but it's not hot, it's not hot. Um, but do you, do you but, find a warmer temperature is more effective? Um, certainly with, with, yes. I guess is the uh, the answer to that. I think for everything. <laughs> <laughs> and can I ask a question? Do you think that Liar is that how I say it? Liar. Yes, I think so. Did the repairs herself? Do you think that was something that she might have done? I think so. I think so because they were pretty, you know, rough and ready uh, repairs. So it was certainly 
not somebody that had skill with leather work that did that did those repairs um okay. and i think you know i mean at the end she she was in custody for for quite a long time so she just had these shoes that you know effectively were kind of like performance i mean they weren't you know mm. so they would have been you know uh all she had pretty much so i'm sure um yeah, she, she was responsible for those, yeah. Yeah. So, sorry, how did they um, end up with the family who donated? So, them? I think, um, obviously, the, the family member, and I don't have their name, um, you know, new liar in the camp um, and kind of saved uh, this, this one little shoe as a memento of her. Um, and uh, and um, ultimately, they that person moved to um, Windsor, Ontario, which is just across the Detroit River from uh, from Detroit and Michigan, basically. Um, and so, a large population of of Jewish people settled um, north of Detroit, and so I think it was seen as a, a natural place for the shoe to end up. Um, so I think they, they knew her in the camp and they just hung on to it. it right, was, um, I see, it was I like see. Like a little, a little memento of, mm. you know, this person was, was fortunate enough to be able to, uh, to get out and, uh, also, you know, survive long enough to be, to be released and, and Maya didn't, so. Mm. Yes, it was unfortunate. She went back to Germany at just the wrong yeah. time. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Very sad, very sad story. Um, I've got another question. This one is about the last, the cape. Uh, were the small inserted backing pieces in the winglets adhesive coated? No, no. So it was like a sandwich and then you say- It was, yeah. it was. So with those, um, because uh, it, the winglets were a little bit more multi-layered so um, obviously you had kind of like the, uh, the, the layers of um, crepe like you had on the actual um, cape itself. And then you had these applique layers on, on the surface. So I was able to put the patches between um, the applique and then the cape surface and then um, uh, the layer of net over and then everything seemed to be kind of like reasonably sturdy around the edges of those appliques. They, so I was able to kind of like then stitch, uh, stitch everything together basically. Was More there, effectively uh, than, the, than the body of the cape itself, which was just so crispy. And do you, is, there, is there any information about where the cape was made? So it was made in New York. Um, there's no information. Kind of Megan was really looking, trying to kind of like determine um, whether Natalia Goncharova was working with with um, Thern or not. Thern is kind of like um, was a company, kind of like Neiman Marcus or Harvey Nichols. So it was a big department store. It was a high end department store, and so um, they sold things under their own label. Um, Right. That were designed by you know designers who also had uh, their own houses and labels um so it was kind of like a little is a, a gray area so she was really trying to determine um you know who the who the actual designer was oh okay was there a label inside then yeah just the store label oh, which had okay. no information about about the designer so. oh okay and um are there any images or photographs of it of the cape being worn no oh. no so and they were pretty uh i mean you know marjorie was uh, you know photographed a lot so yeah. um there are no images uh, sadly of her wearing that or i think of the red one i think um you know, a lot of this stuff um, was just there when the house was turned over to uh, to the foundation to become a museum. So, right. Well, you never know. Something may turn up in the future. Exactly. Exactly. So. 
Uh, there's another question about this, uh, about humidification. Mm -hmm. um, someone is asking, um, can I ask what your normal RH is? What you regard as normal RH? Um, well, it really depends. I, mean, I don't know that there is a normal thing. I mean, you, you kind of... Uh, change it to suit the projects, I think. Um, with uh, with the Cape, I was kind of, it, it started really, you know, quite low. Um, you know, in, in Alabama in the winter, it tends to be, uh, you know, quite dry. So our normal RH levels um, are around, you know, 30%. So to get it up to 70 uh, was, was, was pretty good. Um, right. But um, I have to say, I don't normally, uh, you know, I don't use kind of like tents like that that often. That was pretty much kind of like, I, I certainly have not done a setup like that um, in this studio since then. Um, mm. So I would say, I mean, it really depends on the, on the projects and what you're trying to achieve. Um, yeah. That I was just happy to get it, uh, you know, it just, you know, managed to kind of uh, infuse enough moisture into the fibers to enable me to Move get it flat, yeah. you, know, yeah. you know, which was, which was the objective, so. And um, the damage to me, or the, the, the way it split, um, I, 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 can't, I don't know if you said this, but it looks like a weighted silk. Oh yeah. It, oh, it okay. Must be. yeah. Okay, yeah. so it would have been a tannin or a, a probably tin waiting. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and another question about the adhesive support. Uh, was there a complete adhesive support for the cape made up of small pieces like a mosaic? Uh, so the mosaic was a kind of uh, on the reverse side. So I was using little pieces. Um, just to kind of uh, hold the, the splits together. So to kind of, um, to start to make it more whole and more stable. Um, so that was applied to the reverse side of the silk. And then um, the large, uh, the large areas of loss, I left a little bit of edge on the net so that that could be stitched to those infill uh, organza patches. And then the whole thing was then covered in uh, adhesive coated net. Oh, yeah. okay. From, the, from the, on the exterior. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Um, a couple more questions, and then I, I think we're we're done. The coat from the Battle of Ashila. Mm -hmm. um, how did you decide where to start, Howard? <laughs> <laughs> it's <re> I know exactly. It's really interesting that. Basically, looking at the construction, the construction tells you where you need to start. Um, and certainly with that coat, it's almost like I'm creating a coat within a coat. Um, and so the way that it's seen, the way that it's put together really informs where you need to start. Mm -hmm. um, and so on the bodice, it's kind of like, you know, the, the central kind of like spine section, and then you're adding in the sides and you're just, you're kind of like working your way around. Um, but really the construction informs that. Right, that's interesting. And how long did it take you? Uh, that was around, I, I <laughs> kind of rechecked, it was, it was 428 hours. Oh, okay. So it's not, you know. Mm. Yeah, good. It's up there. <laughs> not bad at all. <laughs> And one thing I wanted to, oh, I'm just having a look. Um, and the damage looked as if it was a lot of insect damage. Was yeah. That, yeah, 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 yeah. Shame. And um, I, so I am just look, looking through um, these questions. Um, you're talking about getting your supplies from the UK. Are there similar? suppliers of conservation materials like whaleys and everything in the US? Uh, not as much, not as much really. It, it's great for kind of things, um, you know, we have like test fabrics, which is good for, yeah. you know, uh, tapestry linings and things like that. But honestly, I, I, I buy most of my stuff in the UK. Um, 
Okay. So, and can you I have a little brown package that arrived from Dukeries on Saturday right behind me? So, <laughs> yeah. And can I ask where you get your curved needles from? Uh, fine science, fine science tools. Fine science tools. I'm writing this down. And I know when I know when I was at the studio, Claire found um, a supplier in Norfolk that was the same. So that yeah, fine, I, can't remember, fine. I can't remember who sells them over there, but no. So this is the U.S. supplier, is it? Fine. So I get them from the U.S., but they're they're an international company. Oh, so if I go if I Google find science tools, it'll come yes, up. it'll come up, and I they're great not. for um, tweezers and see. And I mean, it's it's mostly you know medical supplies. Oh, okay. So they're they're great for tweezers and small scissors and. Great. It's just that we're having trouble here um, uh, finding <laughs> curb needles. Yeah. Anyway, thank you so much. Oh, there's one more question that's been. Um, is there a technical name for a fabric woven with cotton warps and wool wefts? Uh, I'm not sure. It's variations. They kind of call it. Um, uh it, it is kind of referred to as denim um during the civil war period um uh, but i mean it's not it's not what we think of as denim um you know in kind of like blue jean material um yeah but they do they do kind of call it that um but yeah and, it, and it's unusual i've only uh seen it on uh, a couple of coats like that most of them are pure wool um certainly his trousers that i'm going to work on next are pure wool um mm. interesting so yeah yeah and we've just had somebody um uh letting everybody know in the uk for curb needles there's a supplier called restore products there we are. That, that could be useful. Um, Howard, thank you ever so much. And we've, we've run a, over time quite a lot, but um, I hope that's been, uh, everyone has enjoyed that. And, um, and thank you so much. What's the time now over there? Uh, it is 2.47. So oh. <laughs> still a way to go for gin and tonic time. So. Oh, well, for us, it's about <laughs> 10 to 8 and time for time for supper <laughs> definitely definitely and lots of people are saying thank you for your talk and and uh, we're very appreciative of it um, oh you're welcome thank you so my last um job is to just say thank you for everyone um who's uh, registered and joined us and um to say that um, the next event um will be on the evening of the 28th of april and our colleagues on the book and paper group are in charge of this event um, and the bookings. Um, so the evening will be chaired by Alice Evans from the Bodleian Library and will consist of short presentations from book conservator Jane Rutherston and two object conservators, Morwenna Stevens and Stephen Umpleby, on the subject of projects that involve textiles, paper, and or leather. And this will be followed by a roundtable discussion between the chair and panelists, followed by a Q&A session from audience members. So do look out for more information on this through the ICON website. That's the evening of the 28th of April. So thank you ever so much and um, enjoy the rest of the day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.